And just a warning on this game, uh, it says that it touches on topics like, uh, it says that it touches on themes of depression, suicide, and self-harm, so if you're, uh, sensitive to those things, don't watch. Pessimix Proto, or one of them, is that non-existence never hurt anyone, and existence hurts everyone. My consciousness swirls in an inky black river of nothing. It feels familiar. I've been here before. And every time I came here, I always think it's going to be the last forever. And yet, wakefulness. Somehow my consciousness stirs. Where am I? I feel so strange. Deeply numb and lost. Almost. I rack my brain, trying to make sense of things. Questions that should be ob have obvious answers. None come to me. Questions such as, where am I? Who am I? What has happened to me? What do I know? I know I exist. I know I breathe. I know this room is disgustingly warm, despite its cold, cold walls. I know that horrible wet sound is driving me mad. I know red blood flows through my veins. I know my heart pumps that blood beat by beat. I know the inside of my stomach bubbles and burns with acid. I know my bladder feels like it's about to burst. I know my intestines pipe shit through, through over a meter of tracking meat tubes coiled in my belly. But not much else. I don't remember what distinguishes me from any other sack of meat. I rack my brain. I reach back as far as I, my mental arm can reach. Underneath the old shell full of baggage rives unpleasantly and glares at me despite having no eyes and I can perceive. The weight of the shelf is crushing my arm. The act of recalling it in itself is painful. It would be easier to just leave it all there, in the dark, where it might be forgotten forever. Just like most of the people that were sent down here into those hopeless tunnels. To the place I lost myself and everything. But no, I won't forget. I have to remember, or no one else will. I reach back further. The weight of a sharp corner starts to scrape layers of skin as I reach further in. Finally, my mental hand clasps around something. A small, soft object that compresses under my fingers. I pull my arm out from under the shelf. The sharp corners gouge my arm open. A crimson river runs rapid and splashes onto the floor. Except, how? My arms never move. I'm not even bleeding. I feel it though. I felt my skin shredding. I heard the sound. I can't even still feel the object between my fingertips. What am I holding? Why is it just what I was looking for? It's a memory. It's small and hovers the faint, like faint smoke in the air. But it's a start. A pathway to more. Yes, I'm starting to remember now. Lizzie, that's it. That's my name. My name is Lucy. It's nice to meet you. That's only a start of the breadcrumb trail, though. I have to follow it. It's easier to live through a memory when you can share it with someone. You'll listen, won't you? You'll help me retrace my steps? Good, good. Oh, but where to begin? Where should the dark fade? Where should I? Wake up! Huh? Finally! Jeez. You were out cold, Liz. I, uh, what? I was covered in sweat, my eyes darting around like flies to figure out my surroundings. 
I was in the hangover of a deep dream that clung to me like glue. In front of me was the blurry shape of a person. A boy? A young man? Male, at least. He's staring at me with concern and frustration. Where am I? Who are you? He frowns at me. You really were out there to the world, huh? You're at the workshop, Lizzie. In Pack Rat, where you work. And I'm technically your boss, though I like to think we're all on the same team here. My name is Fred. Those eyes. Man. Starting to ring any bells yet? Not ringing any bells, man. Oh, right, right. And, uh, what do I do? Looking at him now, Fred gives me the impression of a chubby bear. His he face almost has a snout. His nose twitches back and for while he's not talking. Maybe it's thus irritating his nostrils. He pinches the bridge of his nose and closes his eyes. Please tell me you're kidding. I suppose, even with no memory, it's not that hard to deduce. There's sewing machines throughout the room, and I'm seated at one. Clearly I sew. I think I may even have sewn the sweater I'm wearing. I must be good at it, too. It's so soft and comfy. Then again, I can see little scars speckled on my fingers. Were they scars of experience or scars of clumsiness? Let's say it was the former. I laughed at a little chuckle and smile. Yeah, I am. How'd you go in there, though, huh? In truth, I was only half kidding. But I as assumed slash hoped I'd start remembering the other parts once I woke up more. Fred didn't find the joke quite as funny. You people sometimes. Tell you what, Lizzie. You're clearly running low on steam. I really shouldn't do this. But you need the rest. The Mother Matron won't appreciate your slacking. Perhaps you can make it up in the coming weeks. Nah, I don't think I will. Go home, get some sleep. Maybe stop by Spruce's clinic, too. Get a checkup. You have two days off, max. Okay, okay, I'll go home. Except, where was home? Wake up, me. I sat there for a moment, trying to remember where to go. Ooh. Lizzie! Go! Uh, yes, sir. Rarely I stumble out of the workshop. I feel exhausted in my bones. Aches and throbbing pain deeply seated in my flesh. There is a dreamlike haze resting on the world around me. It feels unfamiliar. Clearly this is a place I should know. This is apparently where I work. And yet, I have no idea where I am. I rack my brain and I pat my pockets to help find a clue. Fortunately for me, there is one. A small notebook. I open it and thumb through. Bits and pieces are starting to come back from me as my eyes scan the scatters of diary entries. Ugh. Notes and doodles. I finally find the most helpful page. Right, I remember better now. The boss was correct. I was the pack in pack rat right now. Named so because of how densely filled the area is. Every building here is some kind of workshop or sword zone. Some places here are packed so full you can barely even walk through them. Unfortunately, the place I work was familiar. More broadly speaking, I am in the board of the town, the city, I call home. A secluded place with clothes and makeshift walls made from whatever was available. Scrap metal, old furniture, repurposed rubble. Outside the walls, in endless miasma fog that stirs their things. No one really sees what's out there, and anyone that's attempted to explore the mist is in an eternity. Spooky. If I had to describe this place, I guess I'd say it's like a half-empty glass, filled with dirty water. The glass is fragile, too. Does that make any sense? Not really. Well, it does to me, anyways. More important than metaphors, though, I know where home is now. Although, I, and I could feel it deep in my bones that I needed to sleep. 
there was a detail on the map leave something to be desired. Think it's past me. I'll figure it out. My memory is hazy from being so tired. So I pick a direction and start walking. The lining streets don't make much sense to me, but I follow them all the same. I am alone, but muffled voices keep me company. Sometimes muffled sobs, too. Same. I try not to focus much on them. I think I used to in the past, but my heart couldn't take it. Nothing I could do, even if I wanted to anyways. Everyone's gotta do something for the collective. Everyone's got their jobs, and I have mine. Whatever the mother nature needs of us. My shoes are old and worn, only offering a meek defense against the harsh as all streets. They fit well though, and the ground is dry today. They get the job done. They're like everything, everyone here in a lot of ways. It doesn't matter how weathered you are. The fact that you're so together means something and you were strong enough to keep you together. May your spirit it, May your spirit grow like the calluses on your hands or on the soles of your feet, so the mother matron says. In other words, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. The growth of the adversity. And by the end of every thing, you're the best person you can be. Gives all the hard parts of your life a kind of silver lining. Or at least that's how I, what I take from it. Squeak. My thoughts are interrupted by a lump beneath my shoe and a panicked yelp of a small rodent. I lift my foot and the thing scurries back under the grate beneath my feet. There below the street is a tunnel full of thousands of thousands of rats scurrying for dear life through the endless canals. I doubt the poor things even know what they're, where they're going. The one I stepped on somehow managed to climb its way up out of the grating, only for my clumsiness to scare it back down where it came from. I feel, I kind of felt awful inside to that. Throughout the boarding is a network of tunnels designed to funnel the endless swarm of rats underneath our feet. No one knows where the little creatures all came from. They flow like water beneath the streets. Ew. Thousands upon thousands of rats compacted against each other, cornered in filth, and God knows what else. Waste ne matter clumped in their fur. Our primary source of, source of protein. Some kids have to fish for rats, sorting through ones that are too sick and diseased to eat, and ones healthy enough for consumption. The yield is never particularly high. The rats never particularly taste good, unless you know how to prepare them. The one I stepped on had to have been rather surprised, the poor thing. I could only hope maybe my unintentional intervention gave it more time before some kid impaled it on a stick and roasted it. Boy, I don't want to think about this anymore. I decided to keep walking to Spruce's clinic. Um, hello? Spruce, you here? Yes, yes, I'll be right there. Stitching someone up back here. Please, take a seat. I sit down on a stiff chair with minimal padding. It makes my tailbone ache, but I endure. Spruce is known as a resident healer of the boarding. She taught herself it by reading pharmacological and medical books she found in the library, as well as through experimentation. This isn't to say that there aren't others, and try their hand at medicine, but to put it simply, none of them are as good as Spruce. If she can't fix you up, you're out of luck. She walks in the room. Ah, Lizzie. Been a while. Those are some dark bags under your eyes. Working long hours? Not sleeping lately? I haven't slept in days, man. Guess not. <laughs> I passed out at work today. Fred told me I should see you. She rolls her eyes and gives a fake laugh. Ah, of course he would. You have to be sick. It can't be his fault at all, right? <laughs> Jerkwad. Tell him. Let's give you a checkup anyways. Follow me to the exam room. Skeleton's missing a head. A small joke as the exam room is just across from where I'm sitting. She gestures for me to sit on one of the beds, and after doing so, she does her usual routine. Checks my blood pressure, pulse, shines a light down my ears, nose, and mouth. Lightly strikes a, a mallet on my knee. I look around the room, noticing that 
It's gone under some renovation since I last visited. I'm amazed he found the time to decorate the place. It's looking good. Aw, oh, thanks. I squeeze in a little here and there. Usually when I have to watch someone close while they sleep. That's a creepy way of putting it. Oh, you know what I mean. Folks in recovery. At least a few people that experience seizures. Stuff like that. Anyways, I'm proud of how it's looking. Genuinely can't believe I found that poster in such nice condition. I'm happy with how the Phoenix has turned out, too. They are pretty. I look towards the bony fellow on the side of the room. What about him? Is that a real skeleton? Spruce checks my heartbeat and my lungs using a stethoscope. No, it's plastic. A patient that scabs on junk a lot gave it to me as a thank you. Trust me, if I wanted to get a real skeleton, I wouldn't have to look very hard. Comforting. Really wish I had a skull, though. She nods and puts down the stethoscope. Everything seems good from what I can see. But that's just what I can see. Tell me how you're doing. Anything odd lately? Odd sensations, pain, nausea, shortness of breath, stuff like that? I'm a little sore, but I think it's just from overworking, maybe bad posture, and being tired. I've also been seeing things. Hmm? What kind of things? Sometimes. Sometimes I'll be standing there and the world suddenly shifts. Like, right before my eyes, it turns into something horrible. Horrible sounds, flesh growing where it shouldn't be, things that aren't really there. My heart starts beating really fast and I freeze, terrified, and just like that, the world's back to normal and I'm panicking over nothing. My dreams are really strange too. Mm -hmm. You won't believe me, do you? She shakes her head. Wasn't what she meant. I actually do believe you. Just thinking. Wish I could say this is the first time I've heard something like that, but... But? Well, some of the mumblers I'm taking care of now said stuff mm -hmm. like that. Before they turned. Really? Yeah. Can I trust you to keep a secret? I'm only telling you because I think it's important you know. Scream it into my good ear. Uh, sure. Contrary to what people think, the crepuscule isn't the only place where mumblers are made. What's Not anymore, at least. You kidding? Not in the slightest. Granted, people have broken down before around the boarding. You know that. Lots of our neighbor brothers and sisters struggle with feelings of anxiety and depression. Same. But this is different. Mumblerism, or whatever you want to call it, is a much more rare and severe thing. It's like a complete detachment from reality. People stuck in a looping nightmare that never ends. And all they can do about it is ramble. It's like a complete detachment from reality. People stuck in a loop. Oh. That's Mother Help Us. And it's happening around here now? Why haven't I heard anything about this? As I said, it's really rare. I only have a few cases out of all the people I treat. And if the AC gang's been dealing with any, they sure aren't sharing. I'm trying to keep it under wraps, as I haven't gotten to study enough people to get a grasp of the emerging symptoms or causes. And I don't want people to panic. Mumblers already don't get the best treatment by most people. Imagine how people would be if they jumped to the conclusion that they're contagious. Ah, I can see what you mean. To be clear, I don't want you to jump to the conclusion that that's happening to you. You might simply be having sleep deprivation induced hallucinations. Or maybe some gas from junks is making the air a little funny. Hell, maybe the shit you- He stops himself for my sake. I mean, shipyard. It's just more rank than usual. I thought it important to warn you, though. For now? I'll give you some medicine that should help with the anxiety. Stop back for regular checkups and we can keep an eye on it. See how it develops. I'm gonna turn into a zombie. What's gonna be in it? 
It's a mixture of lavender, valerian, lemon balm, St. John's wort, and some other stuff that makes it taste good. My latest and so far most effective concoction. Or so my patients tell me. Thanks, Bruce. Anything else worrying you today? No, I think that's it. Fred gave me some days off to go to sleep, so I'll do that once I leave. Alright, that's good. I don't see anything else abnormal with you, so I think we're done. Oh, I'll give you some tea that you can drink that can help you fall asleep if you have trouble, just in case. While I go get stuff together for you, can you run that bucket of food over there to the shack out back? No. The mumbler shack? Yeah. It's about lunchtime, and they need to eat. Would you mind? No, not at all. <laughs> Great, thanks. There's keys hanging up by the door. I grab the bucket, which is full of some carefully assembled sandwiches wrapped in paper and bottles of water. I exit through the back door, which leads to a small yard with a small, roughly sized, or uh, roughly shed sized building, maybe slightly larger than that. The windows are barred. I have never liked coming back here, as ashamed as I am to say. It's always good to help the mumblers, but I mean, I can kind of hear them from here. It's very unsettling. Just endless word salad. If you try to per parse what they're saying, you'll get these horrible vignettes of misery that you wish you could unhear. They can't help it though, and I shouldn't feel threatened even if I find it uncomfortable. Mumblers are harmless. I repeat that to myself as I unlock the shack door and enter. Inside a somewhat cramped, but generally well kept bunk room. Some bodies are sleeping, others are sitting upright on the bed or standing near the corners. None of them notice me. They're lost in their own nightmare loops. God, poor thing. I really wish I knew how to help them. These people deserve better. Most of them were hand selected by the mother matron to bring the horrors of the crypt school. A labyrinth of darkness that lies beneath our home, full of terrors that are kept at bay by a lock tunnel. No one really knows why the mother matron sends people down there, or what they end up finding, but. You can see the effect it has, at least on the ones that make it back home alive. I shudder as I consider what could have happened to the four souls that didn't return. I can only hope that they passed on peacefully, and whatever ended them was swift and painless. I ponder almost if that would that end would be preferable to what the mumblers go through now. They're alive, but can you really call this living? And these ones here in Swiss care are the lucky ones. Many don't get the help they need. Some are hurt, bullied, killed. At least once. People call them waste of space, drains on our ever dwindling resources, mouths of feed that can't contribute anything meaningful, or so people say. But they're people. They didn't choose this to be so broken. They need help. They need love. I would want people to take care of me if I ended up like this. I don't know. Maybe that line of thinking will lead us to starve to death someday. Would my morality hold up on when my body is dying from weeks of no food? Can I eat the concept of doing the right thing? It wasn't Tim's fault. I swear to God, it wasn't his fault. I would like to think that it's preferable to die because of the good things you did than to survive because you gave up your humanity and compassion. At least right now, I feel like that's the choice I would make. Anyways, I've been kind of standing here holding a bucket of sandwiches and water for a while while I was lost in thought. My arm is shouting at me to give it a break. I drop the bucket in the middle of the room. Do they, like, come get the sandwiches and wander themselves? This Bruce feed it to them later? A question I was seeking answer to another day. I leave, gently closing the door behind me. I get my medicine from Bruce on the way out of the shed and head home. Feeling my body already starting to power down, I walk through the door of the house ready to throw myself onto the mattress before something catches my eye and freezes me to my step. Resting atop my bed was a paper envelope with a red wax seal. 
emblazoned with the matron symbol. My heart sank to the bottom of the deep, dark canyon inside me, and bile began to bubble and turn violently in my stomach. I rushed to pick up the envelope, hoping that this was an illusion. I took the light. It wasn't. It was real. As real as can be. The letter with the red wax seal were a legend amongst the kids in the boarding. They say that it's the worst, most horrible piece of paper you could ever own in your entire life. I undid the seal and removed the letter inside. I unfolded it. My eyes darted back and forth, scanning the page. It read as follows. My dear, my dear, oh, my dear oh. child, the very thought of you warms me so. Mm -hmm. Seeing you and your siblings grow through the years is always my special delight. I give so much of myself every day to ensure you all remain safe and secure inside these walls. I bet. Alas, I cannot do everything on my own. Every so often, I must rely on my children's support to do what must be done for the collective good, even if it means sending my darlings into the jaws of danger. This letter is to inform you that you have been personally selected to become personally, a huh? surveyor. This is a title of great honor, bestowed upon those that will brave the depths of the crepuscule for your mother matron's pride as well as the continued survival of the boarding. You will be paired with two boys named Pucks and Rich. As soon as you receive this letter, you are to meet with them, make preparations for your journey below, and visit me at my dwelling in Mother's Tower. Attempts to shirk your duty will be met with severe punishment. Oh boy. I will see you soon, my dear. With all the love in the world, your Mother Matron. I stare at the letter. My legs begin to wobble. My hands start to tremor. And the letter floats to the ground, like the way they describe leaves in books. I start breathing fast and hard. My entire body quakes. My eyes roll to the back of my skull as I pass out and collapse to the floor. Oh boy. Ah, I'm back here. Did I die? Was that everything? Was that the end of my memories? Kind of abrupt, to be honest. Did you ever hear the story about the girl in the sweater? No. Of course not. It's still being written. I hear it gets daylight crispy. I'm so excited. Demons. What the? What is this thing? What am I? What are you? What is anything? Oh boy, the creature can hear my thought. Everything and everything were nothing once. And they became children. I think things would have been better if they stayed as The Defender's Call existed as widespread and cancerous. Extremely violent. It infected everything that was nothing and forced it to deal with the pain of being. Forcing things that exist to be happy that they exist. Manipulative. Terrible. Oh, but enough about things. Pardon my language, but what the fuck is this thing talking about? And why does it kind of look like me? Ignoring my confusion, creature steps around me and outside of my vision. It fiddles with something behind me. The slurping sound grows faster. This world fades again. I'm awake again, deeply confused, but awake. I sit there on the ground, frozen for a while, before reality hits me again. I stare at the painting on my wall. The mother matron. Out of every person here that could have ever been selected, she ends up picking me. My mind is back to the Mumbos and Spruce's Clinic. Them and the endless droning madness that's consumed everything around me. The entire people with dreams and personalities are erased by the trauma. Why? Why me? I think about I think back to how I was supposed to work in a few days. How was I supposed to visit Spruce again to make sure I was better? 
to keep living longer, no matter what I wanted to do. The decision was made for me. Mother needed me. I was not the kind of person that wanted to find out what happened when mother's disappointed. But where to begin? After some thinking, I decided a good place to start would be asking my neighbor's sisters. There's a pair of twins named Jane, Janine and Katie. I like to think we're pretty good friends, but I was glad to have them as my neighbors. I approached the front stoop. Katie was reading a, from a book with a faded cover oh, while, the, uh, while her sister painted her nails with jet black nail polish. Hey Katie! Hey Janine! Oh. Hey Lizzie! Hey Lizzie. You seem chipper. I thought you'd be more gloomy. What do you mean? Oh, well, I... I saw the poster come by and drop something off at your place. They don't come by that often. Surprise, the mail boy doesn't want to visit the shit zone. Oh, I didn't explain that, did I? Well, you saw on the map that my home is in a place called the shipyard, right? It's, a. Uh, it's not actually called that. See, it's actually named after the fact that this area is where the majority of sewage and waste is started. I'm sure you can guess what the actual name is, knowing that. Cursing makes me feel bad though, so I call it the shipyard instead. You absolutely cannot evade the smell here. It's awful. It sticks to everything like a film. I've gotten mostly nose blind to it at this point, though sometimes I still have to break my perfume. Is it one of those letters? Yeah. Red seal. Oh no. No! Oh, we don't die. Use your mind. Supportive. Janine! What? Just being real. It was nice knowing you. Thanks. But don't be so insensitive! It's okay. I'm still processing things, but I'm holding it together. I still have things to do before... before I get out. Anything we can help with? I thought you were a fan of hers. At fair point, I guess. It's odd for someone that is a free cleaning of a person to not know much about them. I mean, I look up to her and read the scriptures like most everyone else, but it's different than meeting her in person. She nods understandingly, then shrugs. Fair enough. Unfortunately, I've never met her, so I wouldn't know. Lovely. Katie shrugs with an apologetic expression. She also has never met her. Um... Sorry, I don't think I know much more than you, I'm afraid. Yeah, the books never really went into what's down there. The Mother Matron never really talks about it other than how dangerous it is. There's not any first-hand accounts of it to go off of. Most anyone seems to know is that it's like an endless series of tunnels with dangerous creatures inside. Creatures. Some people say the corpse wheel is constantly shifting and morphing, almost as if it's alive. That's just a rumor. Again, no first hand comments. Any advice to you? I had a phase where I read nothing but books about surveyors, just in case I ever got picked, you know. The Mother Matron wrote some books on her book you can find at the library. If you know where to look, there's also unauthorized books about them that were put together by people who knew the surveyors before they left. I wish I had time to read them. Honestly, they're kind of dry in the sand. Probably better to get the highlights from someone else. Best advice I can give you? Preparation is key. Try to be ready for everything and anything. Also bring something sharp. Hope that helps. Okay. Thanks. Mm. Now where I can find books on her? Mm. Nope. Can't say I know them. Katie? Me neither, sorry. 
Maybe you should ask around the market? I'm sure someone there would know. Maybe try meeting Marissa. She's a little... odd. I don't recommend trying her cuts, though. Unless you've got a bark bag. Oh boy. Why is she called Meaty Marissa? Because she sells weird meat. Is it human? Oh. I thought there'd be more... T what more do you need in a name? Uh... Katie looks after me. And it smiles and shrugs at this to say, nothing interesting, but go ahead. She hands me the book, keeping her hand on the face she was on. I grab it, holding it in the same spot so she would be in the place. The cover is found a script, save for some initials on the spine. It might have had a dust on the a dust jacket or something before, but that bore the title, but it's long gone, I'm sure. Hmm, I have a hard time following it. Lots of names I don't recognize. Something about someone named Nix. And people or creatures, hard to tell without context, they gave birth to. You. And then people that those children gave birth to. Maybe it must be some kind of fantasy novel or something. I doubt it has much relevance to my situation. Or if it does, I sure can't see it. I think those are the Egyptian gods, aren't they? I smile and hand the book back to Katie. for your help. I should get going. There's a lump in my throat. I swallow and talk through it. It, it was really nice knowing you guys. Suddenly, Katie embraces me tightly. After a moment, she's looking at me with twinkling moist eyes. Lizzie, you better come back. I'll never forgive you if you don't. Well, I'm sure gonna try. She holds me for a moment longer, burying her face in my chest. Before she can stain it with tears, she pulls back. I can't think of the right words to say, so I simply smile at her and say thank you. Janine simply gives me a gentle wave. It's subtle, but I know there's something she rarely does for people. Take care, Lizzie. We'll be rooting for you. The atmosphere is chaotic as people rush in and out to buy food and other supplies with their allowance. Real dystopian. I felt my senses bombarded by the endless chatter and the myriad of smells, many of which were quite unpleasant. And I live near a sewer. Through the cloud, I slipped to what I hoped was the west side of the market. I tried to keep my eyes above the crowd to find that Mr. Arius Meaty Marissa character. I found her quickly. Or rather, I heard her. Fresh meat! Fresh meat! Come and get your fresh meat! Come one, come all! Tired of rat head cheese? Absolutely sick of fly patties? Come try the most unique cuts of meat you can find in the boarding. Flavor beyond comprehension. Uh huh. Then she finds me, her eyes locking on me like a hawk. You there! A beautiful lady. Come, come! Try Meanie Marissa's signature cuts! Name pending. Against my better judgment, I stepped towards the stand. I'm pretty sure I found her, but I ask anyway for confirmation. So, uh, you're Meanie Marissa. I've been looking for you. Ah! I see my reputation precedes me! Another eager customer looking for the most scrumptious, sumptuous, munchous meat! You won't be disappointed. Hmm. Before I can say anything, the strange girl dangles a big fat slab of meat directly in front of my face. Mm. Feast your eyes before you feast. Mm -hmm. Once you get a glimpse of my cuffs, you won't stop drooling. Uh, don't worry, I provide three napkins. The strange slab of flesh is in front of me, has a strange kind of marbling and grayness that's so 
downright repulsive to the core. My stomach immediately twists itself in knots. Uh, what kind of meat is that? I told you! It's the tastiest and most unique meat in the market! Uh-huh. That does not explain anything. No, I mean, like, where is it from? From my supply, of course! <laughs> you think I resell other people's cuts? Ha! The nerve! I don't think that's what you meant, ma'am. No, I mean... What I mean is, that doesn't look like rat meat. Or any other kind of meat I've seen to come to think of it. It looks strange. Most say <laughs> She puts a finger to her lips and lets out a shh. Shh! Trade secret. The investors own it. It's gotta be human. You know what isn't a secret, though? How delicious it is! Read the reviews. She thrusts a long piece of paper in front of my face. Apparently it's a full of real reviews by her customers, written by hand in a messy script. Unique. Tastes like nothing else. Not the worst I've had. I would describe it as edible. A journey into flavor town of must taste. Eat it right now if you can. Guy Fieri over here. Um he withdraws the review scroll. Come on, it's only 30 giraffe. Savor the flavor. Doesn't it look sucking? Mouth watering? Doesn't it get that stomach grumbling? No. Hmm, she sure is insistent. I ask myself morbidly, should I buy it? Please don't. From here on, you may encounter situations where you have a limited amount of time to make choices. To survive, you'll need to act and think act fast and think carefully. I'm not gonna bet. The penalty for running out of time will vary depending on the situation. In some instances it may be consequential, but others possibly not. Sometimes it may result in instant death. In other instances, Lizzie will have to rely on her gut. You might make choices you don't want. Be wise, alert, and cautious. Good luck, and don't forget to save your game often. Sure. The Midday Meat Pocket. I knew this was prob probably a mistake, but... Alright. I'm going to save my game. That's not what I wanted. Mm. Uh, okay, I understand. Wait, you said yes? Oh, uh, I mean, uh, of course you did! <laughs> no refunds! No refunds, huh?
you know. Self voicing disabled. Hopefully hamper my hand hard earned thirty drags. Here then. I held the meat in my hand, feeling that I overlooked some important detail. If I had nothing to put the meat in, I'd have to put it in one of my pockets. Full of thread, I slid the parcel of meat into my pocket. I heard a disgusting explosion sound, and the red both the purchase and my very first instantly. Anything else you can do for you today? Yeah, actually, I heard you might actually be able to help me find some people. Oh, here for the flesh and for the fresh information. I'm happy to oblige a happy new customer. It's on the house. What would you like to know? I would have much rather just paid for the information instead. Oh well. I'm looking for two boys. One named Cooks and the other named Rich. I don't know oh, a lot about the person, right? oh, Rich, though. You are not. Rich is a friend of mine. I don't know how he feels about me. I like him though. He's such a soft guy. Oh. I can see her eyelashes flutter wistfully as she thinks about him. Oh, I found it. Heck yeah. So 
suddenly she ran out and said she's actively being watched by another human being. Uh, no, I didn't mean like like that. Like, friendly like. Understand? No. Uh, anyways, he lives in one of those bunkhouses near the west edge of Fort Careful, though. The AC's have been swarming around there lately. That's odd. The bunkhouses are right near the border between Forgot and No Lie, aren't they encroaching on Spurs' territory? Some major shit went down there apparently near the friend's shed. Uh, before you get too excited. No, the beast in the shed didn't keep it so The friend shed is a kind of local legend. They say it was that there was a lonely kid that used to hang out near the shed to in No Lie which was the original location for the market district before the Three's company moved everything. The shed was locked up tight and no one had ever been inside of it. And yet this lonely kid and they heard a voice coming from it. Someone alive, stuck in there, that just wanted to have a friendly talk. The lonely kid spent all of his time up there in the friend's shed, playing and laughing, talking with the friend all day long. He'd get picked on for what appeared to others as him just talking to himself. Any attempt made to prove that there was a voice in the shed ended in failure, which in with the voice remaining silent when anyone else was around. The kid didn't need to be believed though. He had the friend he wanted. But then apparently the shed was unlocked. The kid went inside and was never heard from again. It's worth noting that if the shed did unlock, it was unlocked very soon after, as it still boarded up tight. I'm sure the kid was real. Urban legends are usually, have usually small nuggets of truth in them somewhere. However, I think what really happened to them was that a troop of the AC gang may have simply killed him while trying to rob him. They hid the body, and since the kid didn't have many friends, no one looked. Oh, no one tried to find where he was buried. And so his fate instead became part of the tapestry of a legend. Kind of sad in a way. Some dudes got killed. They were an isolated patrol hanging around up there and they were killed. I don't know who was responsible, but I suspect the killer was hiding on for it. Spruce gave him special permission to do searches in limited areas. So there. Spruce is an unofficial mayor of Forgot. And she's backed by a peacekeeping institution that calls themselves the Four Leaf Clovers. Given the AC's violent tendencies with selling the drugs, they don't get along. So for her to allow them to look around and forgot is really abnormal. Something terrible must have happened if she's willing to give them inches. Personally, I think it might be a ploy they made up so they could slightly expand their reach. But that's just my impression. Surprised I didn't hear about any of the stuff until now. Casey's got to project an aura of being in control if they want people to take him seriously. It makes them look bad, they can handle some pulse slicing the boys apart deep in their own backyard. They're trying to keep it under wraps until they get the guy. I see. Anyways, back to Rich. Can you tell me where he lives? Oh, right. You got a map? I can show you where it is. I hand her my hand on that. She throws her brow a little at it, but her brother marks the spot with an X. As, As for pulse? As I said, I don't know much about him. I think he lives in jokes. But good luck finding him. I don't know what kind of brain damage you'd have to have to live there, though. Mm, maybe that's mean. Something genuine might have fallen on his head over there. I probably shouldn't say things like that. That was rude. I understand what you mean, though. I'd still want to live in a place where garbage can drink balls from the sky. Not that I have no drink to talk, I guess. We could live in the shipyard, right? I feel sorry for your nose. Honestly, surprised you don't smell worse. I have a smell. What? You didn't have to say all that. Anyways, I think I have what I need for now. Thank you so much for your help, Marissa. No problem! She gave me, uh, the heebies. And the jeebies. It's a slog of a journey to Fogai, and following the vague directions the map provides certainly does not make it any better. I should really get a, make a new feed. I should really make a more detailed map sometime. Why is this place called for that anyways? I really wish I could remember. Uh oh. That's why. See, it's a funny story actually. The story goes that the name came from a kerfuffle that happened forever ago. Back when the originals were like the foundations of the boarding. But I don't mean by that I don't mean the buildings and stuff. They were found where they are. 
wasn't really fit for life though. So the originals were tasked with making it livable. Eventually, once things were settled, the originals were sex began sectioning off the boarding in the district. Being named by whoever was appointed to run that particular district. Forgot before it was named Forgot, it was established by Saren Butcher Hodgkins, who was best friends with Junks, founder of Possum Braddy. These are with pe for people with good reputations. The two went on to a celebratory romp with some jugs of potato rum in their homemade chemical concoction, a drug that would eventually go on to be called Can Heat. Anyways, as you might have heard earlier, stuff falls from the sky and Junks. Well, at the time, that had not happened yet. There was garbage there, but no one had ever seen it fall from the sky. Can you see where this is going? A porcelain pug dog, about half the size of a person, fell right on top of the butcher's head while well, he was taking a massive pop of candy, exploding an impact in a mess of shreds. Yeah. Miraculously, the butcher survived, but with a permanent memory loss. And so, when it came to officiate naming of his district, they asked him what he would like to call it. I forgot. I don't really care. And so, one of his subordinates got a little creative with the priest that styling and the name Forgot was born. Bonus fact, canned heat went on to become an extremely popular substance, as some blamed butcher's survival on the drug's supposed side effect of new era and disability. The AC gang apparently was, has a cornerstone on that market and charge a premium for it, though some people have made up their own cheaper concoctions in an attempt to approximate it. I don't recommend trying it, especially the homebrew kind. Stuff can melt your nose clean off. And moreover, it does not make you invincible. It just makes you numb to pain. Or at least that's the closest conclusion on the matter. Sorry, sometimes I have too much fun talking about stuff I've learned. The boarding isn't a nice place to live exactly, but it has character to it. It's history, especially. I shouldn't waste so much time exposing exposing them. I'd be in a lot of trouble if I ran into the NAC gang patrol. Careful not to make much noise or close the door behind me. No interest in being hassled. I just want to find her and get out of here. Ideally, I should try not to spend too long in one place. I haven't run into anyone yet, but who knows? This building is kind of big. What could be hiding here? Hopefully just rich. The walls are scuffed and filthy with feeling paint that flakes off like petals on a grimy flower. The musty smell of mold and mother knows what. At how many years of dust that's been clinging to dear life, wasting or waiting for the living to send it flying. Less graffiti than I expected, though. People with creative bones usually get a lot of inspiration from terrible places, it seems like. Oh no, there's something. The entrance hallway terminates in this odd junction between rooms. A small set of stairs leading into the darkness. The matron seals are painted on the wall above and splatters of red paint. I really do not like this place. Something about it makes the hair stand on my stand at attention. I feel like a rat in a starving cat's house. Nothing to be done, though. I have to keep moving before the terror paralyzes me. Immediately, I begin to regret not having thought to bring my own lantern. Already at a fork in the road, with each path obscured from shadow. Oh god. Oh. I find myself trudging down a dark, very dark hallway, only faintly lit up at the end of the hall. I walk slowly and carefully to avoid any obstacles to scare in the darkness. With hands crawling the wall of spiders for guidance. The texture is rough beneath my fingertips, oddly comforting. As I make my way towards the light at the end, my hands reach into nothing which causes me to panic and fall. I couldn't see it at first, but there was a path to the right leading the ambush. Therefore, I can see nothing except more shadow. Soft darkness waiting for me to wade in its waters. If I go that direction anyways. Mm. The lit room at the end of the hallway is a dead end. A surprisingly large room has nothing in it. Probably some kind of storage room. I'm surprised no one's made it their home. Though, people kill each other in brick town rooms for a quarter of the site. Huh, there's a hole in the wall apparently. Did it used to lead to somewhere? Doesn't matter now, I guess. I should go back the other way down the hall inside hall. 
Nothing for me in this direction. I think that, but then something catches my eye. Huh, one of those heart listening things. Is that the scope? Odd place for one of these to be, though. Maybe Spurs might want it. I should take it with me. Pushing my hand towards it, something in the air. An ugly buzz that hovers just above the quiet. A tremor in the air around my head. Before I can pull back, I've already picked it up. Oh. A sterile room. It sits in a nexus for the lost and destitute. A woman sits there, a bundle of nerves. Her eyes scan the room. The wall is barren save for the strange symbol that the nexus have for the lost. The st by the sh that strange symbol that the nexus for the lost and destitute have a fixation for. It. The cabinet on the other side of the room must be full of that shit if they inject into you when they you overdose. An undo button of sorts, she thinks to herself. The girl ponders how much money must have been spent in vain attempts to prolong the lives of people like herself. People so hopelessly stuck in their own in the brains or on cruel chemistry of their own bodies that they cannot help but perceive self-destruction. People who carelessly treat their lives just as disposable as tissue, people willing to burn every bridge, turn over every stone, leverage every asset, all for just one more time. Hospitals and medicine, as far as Loretta was concerned, but for people far more deserving. People who will actually get better. People that actually want to get better. Not filth like her. Don't talk about yourself like that, Loretta. Part of her wishes, her mother had just given up on her for her own good. Then it would be way easier for oh, Loretta to un despawn herself in peace. With a cosmic eye so strong, it would pulverize her soul into shards of glass and fry her brain like an omelet, and her useless, selfish little heart could finally rest. The kind of death, or even better, a world where she simply never existed. These kinds of thoughts were medicinal to Loretta. Mm. Yikes. And things, when things were at their worst, she simply could retreat into the reality where she simply never was. Those that she hurt would live unsullied, beautiful lives, where every goal was achieved, goals imputed by Loretta's existence. And who knows, maybe if she found a place where no one could find her, she could turn this world into a re that reality yet, with one beautiful explosion of euphoric chemicals that would make rock stars blush. Then her thoughts interrupted. A door opens. A doctor walks in, his face stiff, pressed in a small, tight frown. He's rehearsed in a mirror, but performance anxiety still grips him. So, what's wrong with me, Doc? Sheena's been saying it's just withdrawal, but this doesn't feel like it. I'm worried it's something worse. I'm not sure how to tell you this, Loretta, but you're pregnant. You're pregnant. We'll have to do an ultrasound to figure out how long you've been pregnant for, but pregnant all the same. How... how is this possible? How could I not know? It's rare, but still more common than you might realize. It's called a cryptic pregnancy. brain explodes in panic pulses of memory. Dingy rooms, memories of pills, burning nostrils, enough to kill a right racehorse, a friend remarks. Amazed you're still breathing. There's, there's no way. There's absolutely no way. Would you like me to show you the blood test results? More memories assault her mind. I don't care if it kills me. It's one less shitty person in the world. It's only one thing that helps anymore. Leave me alone. I'll do whatever you want, 
I need it, please. It's my life to ruin, not yours. Fuck you and your tests. You're lying to me. <laughs> You're fucking with me. Loretta, I'm really sorry you had to find out like this, but it's the truth. You're going to have a baby. The doctor's face is stone. He's as serious as he can be. I... There's no fucking way. Do you need a moment to yourself? <sighs> yeah. Yes, please. The doctor goes to leave. He stops and looks back at the woman for a moment. Then he leaves, closing the door behind him. The woman is alone. She feels more alone now than she ever has before. She feels like a brick drowning slowly. Beside you in time. Wow. I think I've gone insane, or I'm on the cusp of it. Lovely. Do I even want to try to make sense of what I just saw? Later, in a place that's less creepy than this preferably, I go back and head down the side hall I worked, walked past before. Come to the river, pick yourself a body bag. Fun! The side hall in the darkness eventually leads me to an edge that's lit by a small window with a single doorway. Glimpsing out the window, I think I'm on the second or third floor. It's a little hard to tell for sure. Wasn't I just underground or something? I didn't even go up any stairs. This building doesn't make a lot of sense to me. More artwork too. These drawings seem to mostly be done with chalk or very thin paint. Some of it seems to glow faintly in the dark. A message too. Come to the river, pick yourself a body bag. I really shouldn't stick around long, but for some reason I feel like I want to examine this room closer. Hmm. What should I do? Let's examine. Why not? I can't help it. I have to look around. Something's calling me. I look around carefully, shuffling around pieces of broken glass, torn carpet, a sort of trash left behind. Signs of life long moved on. Now that I'm paying more attention, there's an odor in here. It's faint, but what glimpses of it my nostrils have are repulsive. Oh. Fun. What the fuck is this? I mean, frick. Fuck! I nearly jump out of my own skin. The sight of a desiccated skeleton of something. A rat, maybe? Uh, who knows how long it's been there. Next to it is a note scrawled on dirty carpet, or cardboard, in the mannequin. I'm too curious. I spent too long searching on nothing but a hunch. Maybe the note's what I'm looking for. I haven't eaten in weeks. My stomach hurt a lot. I found a dead rat. Probably scurried away from the butcher. Clawed at these walls till it died hungry, itchy, scratchy. No one found it in the dark except for the flies and me. The flies ate and ate and ate and fucked and ate and laid eggs and inside its guts. Dead and rotting, its eyes melted out of its head. Lots of eggs, yummy eggs, dotting its skin like grains of rice. I ate it. My tummy stopped hurting. I feel alive again. But now my stomach is going buzzy buzzy. Buzzy 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 buzzy. Oh boy. I regret doing this. I drop the filthy note on the ground and begin to walk away before the light catches my eyes. A shine pokes my retina for attention. It looks like some sort of some kind of pamphlet. Is that the mother matron symbol? What's that doing here? Reaching my hand towards it, something in the air, an ugly buzz that hovers just above the client, a tremor in the air around my hand. Before I can pull back, I'm already, I've already picked up the paper. Hospital. 
a hallway. It sits in a nexus for the lost and destitute, a shelter for broken and vulnerable that can't let go. It's that same hallway on a wooden chair sits a woman. She has dark, messy hair, a t-shirt bearing artwork commemorating the tour of a long-forgotten band from decades ago. The radio stopped whispering their tunes, but in her mind they're full volume on repeat. Background noise to a party that she wishes never stopped. Good times, long gone. She looks to a pamphlet she was handed during orientation. Not even worth the paper it's printed on, she thinks to herself. She throws the pamphlet into the trash can down the hall with a boat basketball toss and sighs. She is not noticed, but a younger girl with blonde hair and a sweater is taking a seat next to her. She sits there idly for a moment, expecting the dark-haired woman to acknowledge her. However, the woman with dark hair is lost in space. At least two minutes have gone about someone in the corner. Oh, at least two minutes into a song about someone in the corner, in the spotlight, losing their religion. The road around her might as well not even have existed. Unlettered, the girl with blonde hair in the sweater speaks. So, what are you here for? <sighs> the girl is unflappable. That's okay. You don't have to tell me. A pause then. Meth. Huh? That's what I'm here to kick. Wasn't my idea, but my folks got worried about me. What? Expecting someone more ghoulish? No, it's not that. I'm just teasing you. She was oddly plucky, and she did not immediately seem to exhibit signs of long-term meth abuse. Compared to friends that dark-haired girl had in the past were, that were on it, she kept herself together rather well. Maybe it was a significantly positive attitude. Now though, that was the cat out of the bag. There was a slight gaudiness under her cheeks, a tired list in her eyes. Suddenly the subtle details became more obvious. The woman in the dark hair, or with the dark hair is pensive. The armor on her tongue suddenly cracks as the blonde girl looks at her warmly. Oxy, my mom dropped me off here. Ah, uh, I see, that's rough. A cousin of mine died from that stuff. Lucky girl nods in understanding. She flashes a bright smile at the girl with dark hair. Oh, what's your name? The girl waits a moment, thoughtful, then- Loretta. I'm Sheena. Nice to meet you. What in the world? Where, where was that? When was that? What, why did I see that? Am I losing it? I should get moving. This place is getting to me. Gotta get richer and get out of here. Through the dark, I find the winding stairwell living into the void. After following the winding staircase which led a which had a strange accident of landings, I finally reached its bottom. The acid in my legs is bur burning after all those stairs. Though I am thankful they were downward. Ahead is a small room, fortunately brightly lit by light from outside. Ah, uh, this place seems a little better. The warmth of the light coming in from the windows is comforting. From what I can see here, there's a, a bathroom to my left and a door at the end of the hall. This place is filthy. Look at all that grime and dirt. Who used this place last? A thousand pigs? Two thousand? How big were the pigs anyways? Could they fit in this room? I've never seen one. Read about them before. I hear they can be very stinky. They sound cute though. Like books, I've, some books I've read even had in illustrations that look kind of sweet. I kind of wish I could hug one. I smile at the thought before a twinkle on the ground catches my eye. Hmm, what's that? Reaching my hand towards it. Something in the air. An ugly buzz that hovers just above the quiet. A tremor in the air around my hand. Before I can pull back, I've already picked up the object. It's a ripped off fingernail. Lovely. It's a dark tiled room. The door is locked. Doors. The room has not been cleaned up in days. It sits in the 
darkest corner of the nexus for the lost and destitute. A girl has been trapped inside this room for just as long, though the mess is not hers. It's the mess of countless others that were here before her. Her clothes are old and in tatters. Not hers, handed down, uncomfortable and filthy, hardly fit for a human being. The girl holds her torn off fingernail in the palm of her hand, her index finger burning with pain. The girl has been pounding her fist against the locked door and child wolf next to it for hours. Blood is dripping and splashing at her toes. Her nails are chipped and bleeding from scratching at the walls like a furious cat. One is thrown completely Fuck off. Fuck off with the cell pump bullshit! She doesn't know. Too Please. many. Let me out of here. It'll hurt. It'll hurt. Why is it so cold here? Are you trying to freeze me to death? Is that what you want, you freaks? Hours pass. How many? She doesn't know. Too many. I just want to go home. Her body hurts all over. Her stomach has felt like a cauldron for what seemed like eternity. She can almost imagine little holes forming in her stomach lining as it cannibalizes itself. Cannibalizing itself. Maybe that's the trick. Maybe that was what was required of Sheena. How hard could it be? She always heard that the force it takes to bite through a finger is little more than biting through a carrot. Her fingers are bony and thin, but looking at the flesh on the finger where her nail had fell off, looking at how red the red glistens on the nail bag, like cherry sauce on a sundae. Gross. Maybe it's delicious, like heaven and life all, all at once, right on your tongue. Just as she begins to open her mouth, the door swings open, as if it was that easy the whole time. A man stands here, his eyes filled with a dark determination that's somehow more frightening than death to Sheena. I can get what you need, but you're gonna have to come with me, come help me first with something. Take this and come with me. He hands the girl an old, rusty kitchen knife and begins walking. Oh boy. She stares at a quiet moment, stunned and whimpering. Then she follows. Are we going to a party? Holy sh sheesh. Smooth. That was scary. Something about that was so vivid and real, and not a breath. My fingers hurt too. I should get moving. There's gotta be something better through the other door. At the very least, I don't wanna be here anymore. You know, call me crazy if you want, but I got a good feeling about this door. Oh mother, I'm really going crazy. Oh mother. Get it together, Lizzie, get it together. I knock on the door gently. Hello? Is anyone here? Yeah, I'm here! I shrieked and stumbled backwards. What the hell? I mean, heck, did you come from? Sorry, I was sleeping. That's weird. You smell kind of funny. What is that smell? The flank of bizarre steak in my pocket oozes. Without thinking, I was talking about the amount of flesh in my pocket. But the shame of having to justify having purchased it steals my lips. That's not important. Where are you sleeping at? You popped up out of nowhere. It scared me half to death. Oh, over there. He gestured to a small cramp looking hole in the northern wall. Uh, is there a bed in there or something? No. Though so you don't sleep in a bed? Just a little hole in the wall? Yes. You did it too. I've had one for a while. But a couple of those AC gang guys came by and took it. Not that I minded. They needed a place to sleep. 
I'm happy to help. The ground's just fine for me. Ha 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 ha. Hmm. Did they threaten you? I'm fine. Oh, not at all. Oh, that's good. They just kept punching me over and over again until I gave it to them. They didn't bother to me. That's poor too. I don't recommend taking the chair, by the way. It makes your tailbone hurt after a few minutes. Also, one leg just likes to come off sometimes, but you can slap it back on. What? The table is good though. I really like to keep it, but if it stops you from punching me, I don't mind giving it to you. Please leave the blanket here though. I don't like eating off the floor, and last week the neighbor brothers lost their frisbee, so I had to give them my plate. I'm not here to take your stuff. <laughs> oh, you're not? That's a relief. What are you here for then? I explained how I got the letter from the mother matron and needing to find the boy she mentioned in the letter. Oh, I got one of those letters too. Glad you found me. I wasn't really sure what I was going to do after that. I thought about just heading out to mother matron's tower, but he nervously tries to peer behind me. I, uh, they were still around earlier. You didn't run into any of the ACs earlier, did you? Oh, uh, no. No, I didn't. I think it's safe to leave now. I found her telling him about some of the other things I saw on the way through the cookie. He probably thinks I was insane. You're rich, right? My name is Rich, but I don't have any money or anything. Again, not here to take things from you. I really just told you I came here because of the letter. Alright, sorry. Of course I have it. Nice to meet you, uh, Puffs, I'm guessing? No, my name is Lizzie. Weird. You look like a pups. This is strange. I'm not sure how to take that, but okay. I'm guessing that means you don't know who he is or where he is? Nope, not at all. Why does he sound so proud when he says that? Great. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. We just have to go with Carmen. How about we head to the market? I kind of work with an appetite trying to find you. Sure, that sounds great. Let's go. Rich leads the way through the out the building, and along the way, there's something on his me. Despite just coming the way I came, I did not enter the same room. I was back in that one hallway before the junction, with a symbol painted on the wall. I freeze. A cold sweat breaks on my forehead. Am I? Am I sick? Hey, Lizzie, what you doing? Something wrong? Nothing. I'm coming. Just got a little losses off. I trot along, trying to shake the anxiety off me like cobwebs. It still lingers below the surface. The tuned radio. At the market, we both realized that our stomachs were empty, so I decided to buy us lunch. We made our way to the market and approached my favorite food stand, which sat far away from Meaty Morris's booth of mystery meat and some old skewers. Oddly, I can almost swear I felt her gaze. Oh, she's over here. Or over there. She's keeping her distance, but I can see her watching from behind a barrel. She's laser focused on Rich, and he has not noticed that I noticed her. Oh well, I think she's harmless. She's leaving us alone for now, at least. I think she just wants to ogle at her fresh. I can certainly, I certainly will be better equipped to deal with anything that might happen on a full stomach, at least. The delightful smell of grilled rack and vegetables makes its way up my nose and tickles the parts of my brain that cause my mouth to salivate. A strange slimy meat stinking up my pocket makes my stomach turn and twist like a writhing worm. Firstly, I decided to go vegetarian that day. It's mostly carrot and potato. Rich, beaming and blissfully ignorant of Meaty Morris's shop of horrors, ordered a rat skewer. Oh wow, thank you so much. I don't know how I'll pay you back, but if it, if I take too long, just keep my keep your punches to my body and not my face. I have a real bad toothache, toothache as it is. Jeez, this kid. You don't owe me anything. It's a good-to-know-you present. I had some extra allowance anyway. 
that was a complete lie. The allowance part, I mean. I just wanted to be nice, anyways. Besides, who knew if I even lived to use whatever allowance I had after this whole ordeal was done. I looked for it. He was eating as if he hadn't eaten in weeks. So, um, you're absolutely sure you don't know anybody in thoughts? Nope, not at all. I'm extremely positive. So why does he still sound so proud when he says that? Hmm. So we don't have any leads. Who else could we ask? Hmm. What is it, Rich? Did you hear something? What? A drone. A strange flying thing nearly crashed into Richie's head. But fortunately, it stopped for it. Looking closer at it, it seems to be made out of metal and plastic. What the hell is this thing? Birdie. I think it's a bird. I'm gonna call him bird. Rich, that's not a bird. Look at it. It flies. Of course it's a bird. I suddenly had a headache. The little flying machine made a weird chirping noise, but then rotated slightly back and forth. It almost looked as if it was beckoning us. Maybe it crudely. Look, the bird wants to show us something. Rich, this isn't a bird. Wait for me, birdie. Tweet, 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 tweet. Lizzie is not listening to me. I'm gonna go catch it. Huh? Wait. Wait a minute. Just like that, the machine and Rich take off. Hey, wait for me. Alright, so I think that's a good note to end it on before anything too exciting happens. And that was my first part of Poor Mother Matron. And if you guys like that, um... Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!